Income tax 2023-2024. Listed property, what is the business use requirement? Part number one. Get ready some coffee and stay calm. Because as a taxpayer, you really don't have much else to lose. I mean, come on, man. It's only money. Whatever. Get, get, get your government commie hands off my property. Most of this. First, a word from our sponsor. Yeah, actually, we're sponsoring ourselves on this one because apparently the merchandisers, they don't want to be seen with us. But but that's okay, whatever. Because our merchandise is, is better than their stupid stuff anyways. Like this CPA thinking cap, for example. CPA thinking CAP, you see what we did with like with the letters? And this CPA thinking cap is not just for CPAs either. Anyone can and should have at least one, possibly multiple CPA thinking caps. Why? Because based on our scientific survey of five people, all of whom directly profit from the sale of these CPA thinking caps, wearing this CPA thinking cap without a doubt, according to the survey, increases accounting productivity tenfold. Yeah, at least. Yeah, apparently the hat actually channels like accounting energy from the quantum field ether directly into your head, allowing you to navigate spreadsheets faster. It's kind of like how in like the matrix when Neo learns Kung Fu, or at least that's what the scientific survey saying. So get one because the scientific survey participants could really use some extra cash. If you would like a commercial free experience, consider subscribing to our website at accountinginstruction.com or accountinginstruction.thinkific.com. This information comes from publication 946, How to Depreciate Property, Section 179, Deduction Special Depreciation Allowance, Makers Listed Property, and more, Tax Year 2023, which you can find on the IRS website at irs.gov, irs.gov. Remember, in the first half of our income, tax formula basically a funny income statement most income statements having income minus expenses resulting in net income here having income minus various deductions resulting in taxable income the sole proprietorship schedule c rolling into line one income of the formula noting the schedule c itself is basically an income statement having business income minus business expenses which we could call business deductions resulting in in essence net business income which is what rolls in from the schedule c to line one income of the formula the formula here outlining the calculation on the form 1040 of which we see page one now the schedule c ultimately rolling into line eight additional income from schedule one this is the schedule one additional income and adjustments to income part one schedule c rolling into line three business income or loss this is the schedule c profit or loss from business where we have an income statement format income minus expenses expenses typically having the most different categories within it some of those expenses more difficult to calculate than others like depreciation where as we've seen with prior presentations even if on a cash based system the tax code might require us to do an accrual thing for example if we had a ten thousand dollar piece of equipment we would like to just expense it up front as like equipment expense but the irs will probably force us to put it on the balance sheet as an asset we don't have a balance sheet we've only got a profit and loss so we might have depreciation schedules giving the balance sheet asset account of depreciation contra asset account of accumulated depreciation calculating the current year's depreciation expense for us allocating the cost over the useful life but the tax code also might have upfront depreciation such as special depreciation and 179 deduction allowing us in essence possibly the entire ten thousand dollar amount as an expense in the year of purchase called rather than equipment expense depreciation expense leading to the question why didn't you just let me expense it in the first place and the general idea would be, well, the government was trying to do the accrual thing, which makes sense from an accounting standpoint. But then they came in with the lobbyists and the politicians and whatnot and wanted the 179 deduction up front and so on and so forth. You would expect those deductions, 179 and 
the special depreciation to change over time as politics changes and whatnot, but the foundation, the maker's depreciation to stay somewhat stable over time. Also, the IRS might be somewhat suspicious of certain types of property, possibly called listed property, where they, they're going to be more skeptical even of this accelerated depreciation because they think it might be partially personal in use, such as automobiles. So automobiles becomes a complication, which is often one of the things we have to deal with as a small business because the automobile is one of those things we might be trying uh, to write off. Now, remember, whenever we think about the automobile in terms of the deductibility for a Schedule C, the question is, are we going to be depreciating it or not? Possibly we're going to be using a mileage method. So th we have that further question that we've discussed in prior presentation. Are we using the mileage method? Are we using the uh, direct write-off method if we're writing off the actual, I'm sorry, the actual expenses? If we're writing off the actual expenses, we might have to deal with depreciation. If we have to deal with depreciation, we might have to deal with these listed property rules, which is where we are at this time. All right, so what is the business use requirement? So you can claim the section 179 deduction and a special depreciation allowance for listed property. So the listed properties are point of focus now. 179 special depreciation being those upfront depreciations allowing you to expense a lot of times for most property, like most or all of the depreciation upfront. But now we're at the listed property. So we have possibly some restrictions on those items as well. Okay, so you can claim the section 179 deduction and special depreciation allowance for listed property and depreciate listed property using GDS as a declining balance method if the property meets the business use requirement. So notice that this GDS declining balance also is an accelerated depreciation, which coincides with generally accepted accounting principles, but it's gonna depreciate more sooner than you would have under like a straight line method. All right, so to meet these requirements, listed property must be used uh, pre predominantly more than 50% of its total use for qualified business use. So when we put the property on the books, if we think about a car, for example, then it's often the case that you might be using the car for business and personal use. So you have to use it more for business use than personal use, meaning, over 50% of business use in order to, to possibly get some of these benefits of these accelerated methods that we're basically looking at, the special depreciation 179 and the double uh, declining uh, balance method. That doesn't mean we're gonna be able to write off the entire car because if we put a $10,000 car on the books and we only used it 70% for business, we're only gonna be able to deduct the 70% business portion of the car generally, that what we're talking about here is whether or not we're gonna be able to deduct it sooner rather than later using accelerated methods uh, rather than the slower method of a straight line depreciation. The end result being the same in essence because we're gonna get the same amount of deductions in theory over the life of the car, but we would like to get those deductions sooner rather than later, okay. So that's going to be the, for qualified. If this requirement is not met, the following rules apply. So if you have under 50% allocated to the business for the automobile property not used predominantly for qualified business use during the year is placed in service, does not qualify for Section 179 deduction. So that doesn't mean that you lose the entire ability for deductions. It does mean that you're not going to get that big upfront deduction, which could be quite significant substantial and could be one of the things that might help you to decide whether you're going to take a, a, a method of, on the car, for example, of the mileage method versus the uh, actual write-off method. So property not used predominantly for qualified business use during the year uh, it is placed in service it does not qualify for a special depreciation allowance, which is another format of that upfront deduction. Any depreciation deduction under makers for property not used predominantly for qualified business use during any year must figure uh, using the straight line method over the ADS recovery periods. So usually the makers 
default for most property that's three, five, seven year. Cars are usually five year property. Usually you'd get the accelerated double declining method under GDS, but you might have to use the ADS here and use, which by default will typically use a straight line method, which means again, you're not getting as much of the benefit as soon as you would. So excess depreciation of property previously used predominantly for qualified business use must be recaptured, uh, included in income in the first year in which it is no longer used predominantly for qualified business use. In other words, if you put the thing on the books for over 50% use in the year that you, you bought it, then you're going to get the accelerated depreciation of like the 179 possibly. But then in the following year, let's say it dropped under the 50%, you might have to recapture some of that excess depreciation. And this is again where the tax code gets a little wonky because the 179 deduction doesn't make much sense from an accounting standpoint. You're getting a depreciation upfront before you're actually using the property, which is the point of the depreciation in the first place. So it, so it would seem like you're taking advantage of it if you get this big deduction up front and then it drops under the 50% in the following year, which is hopefully somewhat unusual to happen. But if that happens, then you might have to recapture because you kind of over depreciated in the first year when you said it was all for business use and then you converted it more to personal. So a leasee must add an inclusion amount to income in the first year in which the lease property is not used predominantly for qualified business use. So exceptions for leased property. The business use requirement generally does not apply to any listed property leased or held for leasing by anyone, by anyone regularly engaged in the business of leasing listed property. So this is an exception that might be there for uh, a particular type of industry. So you are considered regularly engaged in the business of leasing listed property only if you enter into contracts for leasing of listed property with some frequency over a continuous period of time. This determination is made on the basis of the facts and circumstances in each case and takes into account the nature of your business in its entirety. Occasional or incidental leasing activities is insufficient. So you can't just basically say, well, I, I've got a couple leasing activities here and therefore I qualify uh, because again, you could see that people might try to do that in appearance just basically for tax code uh, reasons. So, so you wanna make sure that you qualify in the event of an audit in a situation like that. For example, if you lease only one passenger automobile during a tax year, you are not regularly engaged in the business of leasing automobiles. An employer who allows an employee to use the employer's property for personal purposes and charges the employee for the use is not regularly engaged in the business of leasing the property used by the employee how to allocate use. So to, de to determine whether the business use requirement is met, you must allocate the use of any item of listed property used for more than one purpose during the year among its various uses. So obviously this becomes kind of an issue in terms of, okay, well, well now, especially if you, if you think about, for example, a car that has business and personal use, you're gonna have to, of course, come up with some kind of allocation between the portion that's business and personal, for example. So for passenger automobiles and other means of transportation, allocate the property's use on the basis of mileage. So most of the times we're thinking about cars here and automobiles, and so when we're thinking about usages, we can look at the mileage for a ratio method. That doesn't make it easy to do oftentimes because obviously miles are not gonna be in our bookkeeping typically when we're thinking about our financials. In other words, if you use software like a QuickBooks to calculate your bookkeeping, the things that you have related to the automobile will be the dollars spent for like gas and maintenance and whatnot. What you're not tracking in the bookkeeping is the miles because that's not in there. Now, some bookkeeping that, like QuickBooks does have the ability to put miles and stuff in there these days, but that's not part of the normal financial statements. But obviously the miles to track the miles would be the best thing that we could use. It would be the, the activity basis 
that would make the most sense for the allocation of business versus personal. So in other words, you might try to look at the odometer at the beginning of the year, look at the odometer at the end of the year, subtract the two, see the total amount of miles driven during the year, try to get some uh, measure of that. And then the business use of the property, you might want to try to track in more detail, possibly with map quests and whatnot, so that you can get the business miles. And then you have a ratio that you can have. You can take the business miles compared to the total miles and possibly see how much is business versus personal that way, for example. So you determine the percent of qualified business use by dividing the number of miles you drove the vehicle for business purposes during the year by the total number of miles you drove the vehicle for all purposes, including business miles during the year. So the business miles divided by the total miles. So for other listed property, allocate the properties used on the basis of the most appropriate unit of time the property is actually used rather than merely being available for use. So if it's not like a car, then we don't have that activity basis of the miles to use the ratio allocation. So the default might be some kind of time usage that you're gonna have to come up with in terms of a ratio allocation. Uh, and, and you have this question of what if it's just available for use and not being used at all? How can you make the ratio of total time, for example? So for example, you can determine the percentage of business use of an item of listed property by dividing the numerator of hours you use the item for listed property for business purpose during the year by the total number of hours you use the item of listed property for all purposes, including business during the year. So notice what they're not saying is you take the numerator divided by the total number of hours in the year because it's laying idle. You're not using it all the time. So in other words, so so like if you had like a something that calculated the, 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 the postage or something that you're using for business or personal or something like that, right? Then you might say, well, how many times did I use that machine to calculate you know, business mailing, you know, postage or whatever versus how much time I used it for personal. I'm not trying to say total hours in the entire year is the denominator because a lot of the time the machine's just going to be laying idle for much of the time. Now notice some types of things like with the car, you might find a better activity basis, right? You might with the post machine, for example, you might say, well, how many actual stamps did I make for the business versus the personal? And that would be a reasonable kind of uh, analysis on it, but not one that can be predicted by the tax code because it doesn't know the nature of all the different types of machines, right? So with a car, mileage makes sense rather than time because it's more accurate. But for everything else, you can kind of try to default to time, but you can kind of get an, an, an idea of a better activity basis for some pieces of equipment just to, anyways. So entertainment use. So treat the use of listed property for entertainment, recreation, or amusement purposes as a business use only to the extent you can deduct expenses other than interest and property tax expenses due to its use as an ordinary or necessary business expense. So obviously with the entertainment, you want to make sure that you're keeping the, the records on it and whatnot and making sure you're in compliance because those are the items that in an audit you would think the IRS would have most questions about whether it's going to be business or personal. Commuting use. So the use of an automobile for commuting is not business use. Now, again, if you got an audit, then this is probably one of the things that they, that they could come up because the automobile is usually one of the larger kind of deductions. And then the question is, does it qualify for business use? Did you, did you re record it as listed property and whatnot? And then did you include what did you include in the business miles commuting typically isn't in the business miles and you might say well that's weird because i have to drive it to the office for business that's what i'm doing it for but you can imagine that if it's similar to like an employee employer situation then it wouldn't really be fair in other words if i was if i was a w-2 employee i have to commute to work and i don't get any deduction for that right if I'm a if I'm a sole proprietor and I have an office and I drive to the office, 
then I, if I don't get a deduction as an employee, you would think it's not really fair to get a deduction to just drive to the office. And so you have to be determining if you use the car for work, what amount of the miles are for commuting versus travel to like other locations like a, like an employee. Okay, so uh, the use of automobile for commuting is not business use regardless of whether the work is performed during the trip. For example, a business telephone call made on uh, a car telephone while commuting to work does not change the character of the trip from commuting to business, right? So you, the phone call, the, the telephone expense might be deductible, but you would think not the com So this is also true for a business meeting held in a car while commuting to work. Similarly, a business call made on an otherwise personal trip does not change the character of a trip from personal to business. So you can't be like, I'm going to Disneyland. And then like you're making a business call on the way over. So you deduct the whole trip even though you know you you weren't doing much business stuff so the fact that an automobile is used to dis to display materials that advertises the owners or a user's trade or business does not convert an otherwise personal use into a business trip so you might say oh it's advertising because i have my, my billboard my car is a billboard and i'm trying so you can uh, see that argument the iris is okay so use of your automobile by another person if someone else uses your automobile, do not treat that use as business use unless one of the following conditions apply. The use is directly connected with your business. Your property report, uh, your pro you properly report the value of the use as income to the other person and without tax on, uh, on the income where required. Let me do that again. You properly report the value of the use as income to the other person and withhold tax on the income where required. So in other words, it might be considered a form of payment to the other person. And if that was the case, then the IRS is saying, yeah, you might get a deduction in that case. But as is the case with normal deduction activity, it might be income to them. And the IRS wants to make sure that you're reporting the income on their side. And if they are an employee withholding for it so uh, you are paid a fair mar fair market rent so treat any payment to you for the use of the automobile as a rent payment for purposes of item three okay employee deductions if you are an employee do not treat your use of listed property as business use unless it is for your employer's convenience and is required as a condition of your employment you can see uh, can employees claim a deduction earlier now generally you might think back to the uh, previous rules where they had uh, the ability uh, possibly to deduct as an employee the use of the automobiles but a few years ago they made the itemized deductions uh, more stringent so as an employee it's quite unlikely that you're going to be able to deduct the uh, automobile usage un unless you're in very specific uh, type of situations so you can take a look at i didn't go over that publication component in too much detail because of that uh, change in the law but you can go into the publication and, and look at the section for can employees claim uh, a deduction if you want to dive into that in more detail. But the general idea is that a few years ago, the, the law became more stringent, whereas before that point in time, you could have been in some situations more likely to be able to, to take the deduction as basically a, an itemized deduction in certain cases. All right. Qualified business use. Qualified business use of listed property is any use of the property in your trade or business. However, it does not include the following uses. The leasing of property to any 5% owner or related person to the extent the property is used by a 5% owner or person related to the owner or leasee of the property. The use of property as pay for the services of a 5% owner or related person. The use of property as pay for services uh, of any person other than a 5% owner or related person unless the value of the use is included in that person's gross income and income tax is withheld on that amount where required. Exceptions for leasing or compensatory uh, use of aircraft. 
Treat the leasing of any aircraft by a 5% owner or related person or the compensatory use of any aircraft as a qualified business use if at least 25% of the total use of the aircraft during the year is for a qualified business use. 5% owner. For a business entity that is not a corporation, a 5% owner is any person who owns more than 5% of the capital or profits interest in the business. For a corporation, a 5% owner is any person who owns or is considered to own either of the following. More than a 5% of the outstanding stock of the corporation, stock of possessing more than 5% of the total combined voting power of all stock in the corporation. Related persons. So we got this related person issue that comes up once again because, of course, the related persons mean that you might not have an arm's length type of business uh, transaction, free market type transaction. So for, uh, for a description of related persons, see related persons in the discussion of property owned or used in 1986 and so on. So example one, let's take a look at an example. John Maple is the sole proprietor of a plumbing contracting business. Richard Jones' sibling is employed by John in the business. As part of Richard's pay, Richard's is allowed to use one of the company's automobiles for personal use. The company includes the value of the personal use of the automobile and Richard's gross income and properly withholds it, uh, withholds tax on it. So now you have a business situation. The employee is using the car for personal use. That in essence is a form of payment, not in cash, but they're getting a benefit from it. So you would think that uh, you might have to include it in income to them, meaning include it on their W-2 in essence, so that they will be paying taxes on it and withhold on it as in, in a normal kind of situation for income employee employer situation. And that means that if they are reporting income on it, you would think you might be more likely to be able to get a deduction, right? That's how the IRS works. Do you want the deduction as the employer? Yes, I do. Well, then you have to rat out who you gave the money to so that if we're giving you the tax benefit, we're going to get the tax from them. And if they're an employee, even more than that, you might have to actually withhold, right? So the use of the automobile is pay for the performance of services by a related person. So it is not a qualified business use. So you would think that expense related to that might be like payroll expense uh, that, that, would be, that would be paid to the employee in the form of the use of the automobile. Example number two. John, in example one, allows unrelated employees to use company automobiles for personal purposes. John does not include the value of the personal use of the company automobiles as part of their compensation and does not withhold tax on the value of the use of the automobiles. So this use of company automobiles by employees is not a qualified business use. Example three. So James Company Incorporated owns several automobiles that its employees use for business purposes. So the employees are also allowed to take the automobiles home at night. The fair market value of each employee's use of an automobile for any personal purpose, such as commuting to and from work, is reported as income to the employee and James Company withholds tax on it. So this use of company automobiles by employees, even for personal purposes, is a qualified business use for the company. So in this case, you can see basically the difference here. So the, the automobiles that, is in, that its employees use for business purposes. So now the automobiles are mainly used for business purposes, although you have that commuting component to it. So the employees are also allowed to take the automobiles home at night the fair market value of each employee's use of an automobile for personal purposes, such as commuting to and from work, is reported as income. So the personal use component of it then is basically, you'd think, reported as income on the W-2. So they're basically paying taxes on it because they're getting a personal use of, uh, of the automobile, even though the automobile is primarily for the business use uh, situation. Okay investment use so uh, the use of property to produce income 
In a non-business activity, investment use is not a qualified business use. So normally when we think about the type of expenses that should be deductible, you would think, for an income tax situation would be those that helped you to generate revenue. That's most easily seen on the Schedule C. The reason we might get a deduction for the automobile usage is because we consumed it in order to help us to generate the revenue. But with investments, it's sometimes going to be a little bit different because sometimes we think of the investments as passive income. So you might not be allowed to have the same kind of deductions possibly for the generation of passive income or investment income like you would have if you had like active income such as in uh, a Schedule C business. So however, you can treat the investment use of business uh, use to figure the depreciation deduction for the property in a given year. So example, so you use an item of listed property 50% of the time to manage your investment. You also use the item of listed property 40% of the time in uh, your part-time consumer research business your item of, of listed property is listed property because uh, it is not used at a regular business establishment. So you do not use the item of listed property predominantly for qualified business use. Therefore, you cannot elect a Section 179 deduction or claim a special depreciation allowance for the item of listed property. You must depreciate it using the straight line method over the ADS recovery period. So notice it says here you use the item of a listed property 50% of the time to manage uh, your investments. And we saw that 50% kind of uh, limitation is, is something also that could put you in a situation where you can't take the 179 deduction or special depreciation. And then again, possibly could be limited to the, to the type of depreciation that you can take. Okay. So your combined business investment use for determining your depreciation deduction is 90%. Okay, example two, if you use your, your item of listed property 30% of the time to manage your investments and 60% of the time in your consumer research business, uh, it is used predominantly for qualified business use. So, the, so you can elect a section 179 deduction because this time, we have that 60% of the time in your consumer research business. So you can elect a 179 deduction. And if you do not deduct all the item of listed property cost, you can claim a special depreciation allowance and depreciate the item of listed property using the 200% declining balance method over the GDS recovery period. Your combined business investment use for determining your depreciation deduction is 90%.